All right, so we, it looks like we got 21 people so far. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Katie. I am a librarian here at the Lyon Township Public Library. I do adult services, marketing, and outreach here, and I'm happy to answer any library questions that you may have uh, about our collections, our services, our downloadables. Uh, feel free to use the chat function if you want, would like to ask anything right now. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, talking before I hand over the presentation to our guest speaker tonight. So you're going to hear me talk for a little bit. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. If you do see me do like a little pause, it's because I'm continuing to let people in uh, to the Zoom meeting tonight. And, and that's pretty much it. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight for this awesome presentation uh, from Detroit Institute of Arts behind the scenes series in the garden with DIA docent Lynn Bloom and especially give a hearty thank you to Lynn for taking the time to spend an evening with us. Um, I also want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, I know some of you may be a little burnt out on Zoom. Um, but uh, we're doing all of our programs virtually to um, ensure the safety and well-being of everybody. You've all seen the library. It's a little tiny in here. Um, we want to make sure that nobody get, uh, gets, um, we want everyone to stay safe. So basically, uh, that's why we're doing this. Um, before I turn it over to her, I want to go over some housekeeping details. Uh, we are recording this Zoom event. So we'll be spotlighting our presenter, but feel uh, welcome to either turn your video on or turn it off. Um, I know it's a little bit difficult with the virtual to um, get a lot of the, the normal interaction that you normally would if you're in person. So I know Lynn would appreciate some faces. <laughs> um, also, Lynn will be taking questions throughout the entire presentation. I will, however, be keeping everyone muted. Please use the little raise your hand function in the Zoom or the chat option to ask questions or request to be unmuted uh, to ask a question directly to, to Lynn. And you can find the, the little chat option. It's in the bottom middle. It's the little speech icon. If you click on that, a little box should appear to the right of um, the whole window, and you can type in there if you have a question. Um, secondly, I will be monitoring the chat, so you may notice that I may mute you if for some reason your audio comes on. If there's anything disruptive during the Zoom meeting, whether through sound or video, it may result in your dismissal. So we just want to make sure everyone can enjoy this safe event in um, this shared event in a safe and comfortable online environment. Uh, next, I want to invite you to participate in our upcoming virtual events. So tomorrow at 6 p.m., join us for an all-ages trivia night using Kahoot. So you do need to download the free Kahoot app onto your tablet or device. Uh, the theme is Harry Potter. So if you're a big uh, fan of Harry Potter, you'd probably really enjoy that. Um, Saturday, October 17th at 10 a.m., we are hosting Elizabeth for virtual Zumba. And then if you're a genealogy aficionado, join us for Mirror Trees on Tuesday, October 20th at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, a week from today, Wednesday, the 21st at 7 p.m., we will be hosting the American Alzheimer's Association and Rick Bloom from Bloom Asset Management on the essential topic of um, dementia, the care and considerations involved, conversations that you should have, and major decisions to make with or for your loved ones if you're a caretaker. So registration is required for all of our virtual events on our website in the event calendar at www.ltpl.org. And then, um, we also want to invite your feedback. So tomorrow you'll get an automatically generated email with a link to a survey. Um, we'd really appreciate it if you would give us some feedback about your experience tonight, what's working, what isn't, um, the best way of communicating with you, and any ideas or topics for future events you'd like to see in the, in the future because we take that all into consideration when we're planning. Um, <clears throat> so now without further ado, I want to welcome Lynn and pass it over to her. 
Thank you, Katie. Hello, everyone. Nice to see some friendly faces in the crowd. I am still getting my wings when it comes to doing these Zoom presentations. So I'm going to take a moment and share my screen and get myself set up so that I know that you can see what I want you to see. So Katie, are you, do you see the behind the scenes image? Yes. <clears throat> okay. And as Katie mentioned, so you see the green image right now, or do you see? I see the flower. So I can see your slides on the left side and, and then I um, see the, the zoom in on the flowers. <clears throat> You know, I have two screens that I'm working on. So I would like this to be in slideshow view. There you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, as I said, I really prefer to give tours in the museum because I get to interact with all of you and that makes life so much more interesting. Okay, so now are you seeing this that says on the screen that says someone has wished to enter or you don't see? Oh, that um, you can focus on the presentation. I'll take care of uh, continually admitting people. <laughs> Thank you. And so I want to give a shout out, first of all, to Katie, because Katie was the one that suggested the theme of this talk. And I don't know about any of you, but those of you who know me know that I love nature. And this is the most beautiful autumn that I can remember in a very long time. So thanks, Katie, for picking this subject. The theme of this talk is in the garden. And there are a a uh, large number of images that the DIA has selected that we can present using this, this theme. But basically the theme evolves around uh, plants and animals and nature. So while there are many images that you would not expect to see, there are a lot of beautiful images of plants. So um, I will begin now uh, with the thought that there's a reason why we see a lot of art that has flowers and plants and animals in them. And that's because as people, we love our pets. As a hobby, we love to garden and we take a great interest in that. So naturally, artists are very likely to portray in their art things that people want to see. So this first image is the quintessential image that I would think of if you're thinking of the theme in the garden. It's titled Flowers in a Glass Vase and it was made in 1704 by Rachel Roish. She was a Dutch artist. This is a painting. It's an oil on canvas painting. And I have written down the dimensions because I want to give you an idea of what size things are. So this is a 33 inch by 26 inch painting. Let's take a moment to look at this painting. You'll notice that there's a wide variety of flowers and plants displayed all the way from this. Um, can you see my cursor? Shake your head, Katie, if you can. Uh, yes, it's just okay. very small. I don't know how to make it larger, so we'll have to do it. <laughs> That'll be next time. So you can see this sprig of wheat down here. We see a variety of cabbage roses that are in various um, shade um, stages of bloom. You see various lilies, as well as at least two tulips that are in this pyramid um, arrangement. And if you go all the way back down to the bottom, you even see um, an eggplant. And this painter was renowned for her ability to paint this still life genre of flowers. But being a Dutch painter, this is so much more than, than just a, uh, a painting, a still life of flowers. If you look very, very closely at this painting, you will notice that there are things in the painting besides flowers and plants. Do you see what's right here? You see the insects? And as a yeah. matter of fact, I'll give you a close up. There are 25 varieties of plants in this image and there are 16 different species of insects. And 
the reason that Rachel Royce has these image, has these insects and these um, this variety of plants is because she was the daughter of a of a of an eminent scientist by the name of Frederick Reuch. And he was a scientist of botany and anatomy. At a very young age, Rachel worked in his laboratory alongside him and she would help him um, lay out his specimens. And her observation skills taught her to very accurately record plant life and animal life. So she became an expert at drawing things just like this or painting things like this. Throughout her career, she had a fabulous reputation and she became known for this type of painting, specifically floral still lifes, because she was living in a time in 1704 when painting for women was not um, something that you could just paint and you could exhibit your wares. However, that did not stop her. Um, she was Throughout her life, she constantly painted and she was given many commissions. Because of her um, status in society, she received many commissions and she did things that um, typically women wouldn't have been able to do like portraiture. Um, but she was most known for her florals and her still lifes. Now, the reason that she has these um, insects in this painting is specifically to give a moral to the painting. So like a Dutch, good Dutch painting, it has a story behind it. As the flowers bloom and grow, they begin to decay. So they represent the cycle of life. And the same thing with the in insects. The insects attack the blooms and lead to their inevitable destruction. A painting like this would have been um, recognized by uh, the Dutch people as meaning uh, the symbolism and behind this would have been very apparent to the people because they were familiar with a type of genre painting called a vanitas or a memento more, where the painting is comprised of things that um, have a symbol. So again, it represents the transience of um, earthly values and um, vanity and life. Uh, I do want to point out the fact that for those of you who are uh, gardeners, the improbability of this arrangement, if you look at the types of flowers that are displayed, is um, they would not have bloomed at the same time. And this was specifically um, Rachel Reich was able to do this specifically because she was um, so talented in her observation skills and her recording of nature. I would also like to point out that Rachel Reich married a painter as well. She and her husband, I believe his name was Joachim Poole, um, they were both invited to um, join the um, Artists Guild in the Hague where they lived. Rachel and her father and her mother um, lived in Amsterdam, but when she married, she moved to the Hague. And um, she also had 10 children, in addition to a very, very um, prestigious career where she received, again, many commissions and quite a few of them were royal. Any, any questions on this one, Katie? Well, I'm curious, um, were a lot of her paintings with a dark background and is there any significance for that? You know, if I couldn't have paid you to ask me a better question. <laughs> This was the way um, floral scenes were depicted in the 1700s. So this was the commonly preferred background, but it also was her preferred background. She liked to paint this kind of painting and she was good at it. I mean, even if you look at the depiction of these, of these insects, it's, it's very photo realistic. I, do want to point out that if you come to the museum and you look for her, I wish you could see it better in the slide, but if you look for her um, signature, it's right here on this slab. And the other thing that I did forget to mention is that in the painting, you see several tulips that have stripes. So that was actually a fluke of nature. Those stripes were the result of um, aphids that attacked the tulip crops. And so 
at first, the tulip growers were beside themselves because they thought it was a bad thing, but the public loved them. So they wanted them. <laughs> Unfortunately, at first, it was very difficult to predict when the tulips would have the aphids and this virus would attack. But eventually, the Dutch were able to hybridize the tulips, and that's why we have them today. Anything else? I don't see anything. Okay, we'll move on to our next image. At this rate, I'll never finish. <laughs> this is called In the Garden, and it's by an American painter by the name of Mary Cassatt. This painting, although it's titled In the Garden, as you look at it, you can see that this really isn't. The subject of this painting isn't the garden that you see here in the upper background. The subject of the painting really is these two people and the interaction between this woman and this young child. Mary Cassatt, as it shows, was an American painter and she lived during the time of the women's suffrage movement. She was very much a, a, a feminist and a supporter of the suffrage movement. She was not able, like Rachel Roish, to, um, she was living in a man's world still, 1903, a lot of years later. But she was not able to paint using live models here in the United States. Her family was fairly wealthy, so she moved to France and she befriended uh, a group of um, people known as the Impressionist painters. Specifically, she and Edgar Degas became very good friends. You can see in this painting some of the influence that Degas would have had on her because something that's very unusual about this painting, while it might not look unusual today, in 1903 when she, she painted this, it was very unusual, is the fact that you're looking at two ordinary people. This is not someone who's special or a mythological um, uh, figure or someone that's historically famous. This is just an everyday woman and an everyday girl. This little girl actually was a little girl who lived in the village that Mary Cassatt used quite often as a model. Her name is Simone. And the other thing that you notice that um, it, the perspective in this painting puts you right up close, right next to this, right over the shoulder of this woman. And it also has the chair cropped. That's a definite reflection of the influence of photography. And that photography was a, a, a you know, um, a blooming um, art at the time. And Mary Cassatt reflected some of the, um, the techniques that were used in photography in her paintings. Although Mary Cassatt did not like the fact that she was not allowed to use um, live models. Here. Oh, I don't know how that happened, but forgive me. <laughs> not allowed to use live models in her um, to paint from. It eventually became the subject that she preferred to paint, just like Rachel Roach. A couple of things I'd like to point out here is that when you look at this painting, you notice that this little girl's face is surrounded by this hat, which is outlined by this black ribbon that goes across her hat. And then when you look at the actual garden in this picture, it almost frames the hat to further give you the, um, to draw your eye to the interaction and the um, relationship between these two people who are enjoying themselves on what we can see is a very um, nice summer's day in the garden. Mary Cassatt lived to be quite old. Um, she lived to be in her, her 80s. And um, this particular painting was um, exhibited at one point. In, I believe it was in um, 1917. Um, it was exhibited along with 18 other paintings in um, support of the women's suffrage movement. Do we have any questions on this one? I did forget to tell you, um, I'm not gonna mention to you if the painting is um, in oil on canvas. That's going to be a given unless I tell you otherwise. This one is 26 inches by 33 inches and it 
often travels, but it's usually on display. Uh, so no questions at present. Okay, I'm moving on then. Katie, I'm sorry to interrupt, but do you know how to get rid of this? That's what I'm looking up right now. So bear with me. Okay. I don't know if it has something to do with, obviously it has something to do with my mouse, but I don't know. So anyway, we're gonna keep moving on. Uh, we did have a question. Any possibility of getting a list of paintings with, when this is done? I'm guessing that it would be nice to have because if you wanna visit uh, the DIA in person, then you can seek out these images, um, these paintings directly. Definitely, I would be happy to send that to you. And that's a great suggestion, thank you. Because as much as these images are enjoyable on the screen, there just really isn't anything like seeing them in person. So the DIA is open, it's safe, get your tickets in advance and go down and enjoy. So where are we now? We're certainly not in the garden, are we? <laughs> Obviously, we are in a very um, cold environment. You see the snow. I'm going to try to use my cursor and not cause those green lines. And oh, sorry. I tried to click to see if maybe I could click on it and make it delete, but it didn't work. Um, so we're in a, in a snow covered environment. And this painting doesn't have a warm fuzzy feel to it in the least. It actually is quite chilling. You see the snow, you see the rocks. Um, if you look carefully, you notice that there is a stag in the dead center of the painting and the stag is not alive. So that again, um, illustrates the coldness that you are feeling from this painting. However, there is something that is so endearing about this dog that is sitting here loyally guarding this fallen stag from any predators like these birds that are here in the corner waiting for his master to arrive. Edwin Lanthier was a British painter and he was very well known. Um, he had, he actually was the, one of the favorite painters of Queen Victoria and he tutored Queen Victoria's children as well as painted them many times in the, um, and they were accompanied by Queen Victoria's dogs usually. One of the very last paintings that Edwin Landseer did in his lifetime was a life-size equestrian portrait of Queen Victoria riding a horse. Um, I did want to mention uh, the fact that there is a metaphorical meaning to this painting as well. Although Edwin Landseer um, received a, a fair amount of money for his commissions, a lot of his paintings were reproduced and people, ordinary people in, um, in London would have them in their homes. And for that reason, he was very well known. So when he died, um, I don't remember the year that he died, but basically they shut down London in order to, um, for people to be able to attend his funeral. The metaphor that you see here in this painting is, um, again, we're gonna talk a lot about symbolism today, is related to the dog. The dog is in many cultures, a symbol of loyalty. And if, for those of you who have a dog, or probably a cat for that matter, you can see how contented this dog is to just be doing the job that this dog is supposed to be doing, which is guarding the prey or guarding the stag from the prey. And um, the metaphor is that the dog becomes a symbol of loyalty. The people were loyal to the crown. Any questions on this one? I think there's a... Uh, there was a question. Um, one person's wondering why this painting was chosen for this event as it's not in a garden. It isn't in the garden, but this um, initially, so how these talks work is that the DIA chooses the theme and they give us a variety of images that we can work with. And the theme of this is not necessarily staying in the garden, but it's about plants and animals and nature. And so the animals are the reason that this is in this paint, in this, um, in this talk. The other thing I was going to mention is that um, the title of this painting is called Chevy. 
it does have a different title, which is on this next uh, slide. It is a quote from the artist. Wheel, sir, if the deer got the ball, sure as death, Chevy will no leave him. If you can believe it, that is the alternate title of the painting. And by that statement, we know that Chevy is the name of the dog. So that's how the, the title of the painting is derived. All, All right, Lynn. I have a couple, um, sorry for the interruption, I have a couple uh, things to maybe try for removing the green stripes is the first one is in the view options. If you um, unclick annotate, maybe that will remove them. Otherwise, you may have the draw function enabled in um, your PowerPoint. <gasps> mm. Okay, so... Ooh, I don't know if I can fix that or not. Um, hit erase to remove. Is that in PowerPoint? Uh, Clear all drawings. Ah, I got it. All right. Oh, yay. <laughs> Good to resume. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm on the fly. I can't do that right now. I can only, I can barely talk at the same time as I'm, I'm uh, dancing my images. So. Thanks for your patience, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. So let's move on. Now, this one, I understand people will wonder why on earth would this item be in a talk about in the garden. But again, this talk revolves around nature. And what this is, is a shield. It's an actual Cheyenne shield made of um, buffalo hide, buckskin, and the pigments that you see that comprise the painting on the shield come from elements of plants and from um, clay from the earth. This shield is about 19 inches in diameter and it hangs in the Native American gallery. Um, obviously this is a picture of the shield. So the shield itself is only this round area here. Um, this happens to be an image that I have to tell you personally is one of my favorite images. I cannot really tell you why, but in when you're in the museum, if you're a frequent visitor, there are certain images that speak to people. And this one, for some reason, draws my attention. This shield was owned by a Cheyenne warrior by the name of Little Rock. And um, they don't know exactly if Little Rock actually painted this or if he had this painted. And that's why you see the two date, dates there, 1860, and it says 1968, but it should say 1868. Sorry, I didn't correct that. <laughs> um, the reason that it has that range of dates is because um, Little Rock was killed in 1868. But before he was killed, this scene that you see on the shield <clears throat> came to him in a dream. He was visited by, um, as you know, the Native Americans lived in a very symbiotic relationship with the earth. And they believed in a spirit world above. They believed in the, in the mother or the grandmother earth that surrounded you. And they believed in an underworld. And the, um, the image that you see on the, um, on the top of this shield here is a Thunderbird. That was a very, very strong, the strongest spiritual animal that one could conjure up in the Native American culture. Um, he was believed, the Thunderbird was believed to bring the rain and to cause the, the storms and, and their, um, the flapping of the wings was believed to cause the thunder. And you see that Thunderbird depicted here as well as a couple of other spaces here. So this Thunderbird came to Little Rock and offered him not only spiritual protection, but by placing this image on this shield, it offers Little Rock physical protection because the underside of this um, shield is a very hard core of buffalo hide, which repels um, arrows. What you see along the edge here is blue 
paint that is comprised of clay that comes from the sacred Butte um, mountains that were sacred to the Cheyenne people. And in addition to that, you see some black, um, some black pigment, which has faded some through the years. Um, you also can notice that there are a series of seven circles here. For those of you who happen to be nature lovers like myself, that is the constellation Pleiades. And it's interesting to note that um, Pleiades can be seen from all around the world. And there are many cultures who, um, who have legends or myths about Pleiades. The one that we most commonly know is from the Greek, um, the Seven Sisters, um, Daughters of Atlas, but that isn't what Little Rock was portraying in this. The Native Americans had their own interpretation of Pleiades. But everything that you see in this shield, including these long, uh, feathers which are eagle feathers and these shorter feathers which are owl feathers, evoke protection. And so this not only gave Little Rock, this shield not only gave Little Rock physical protection from arrows, but it also gave him the spiritual power to have courage. Um, I love the fact that we have this shield because it really speaks to the Native Americans and the depth of what they believed in. How we have this shield um, is that there is a Michigan connection to um, this because as most of us know, Little Rock was killed in battle. The shield protected him from arrows, but it was not designed to protect him from bullets. So he was killed by Custer's 7th Cavalry. Um, through the years, in through history, we have not treated um, our Native Americans well. And after the Civil War, the federal government um, deployed the Civil War troops to move the Native Americans away from their land and to move them westward. I think we're all familiar with um, the Trail of Tears. And how this shield was acquired is that when Little Rock was killed, it was acquired as war booty. We did not get it from Custer's family, but Custer was married to a woman whose family came from Monroe, Michigan. And um, it was kept in the family for a number of years and then donated to, um, to an organization. And then the organization eventually gave it to us. So um, are there any questions on that one right yes. now? Um, we had one question wondering if most of the hanging items are feathers because one area looked like it was hide or fur. Oh, there is no fur on this. They are feathers. And the other things that you see here are, are a form of um, raw hide with a little piece of um, metal on it, which would be considered like a, I think they're called hawk bells. So they make a bit of sound. But um, one thing I do want to mention is that throughout his life, Little Rock would never have gone anywhere without this shield. This was a symbol of him. So it's a very personal item. And on that note, I'm going to go to our next slide, which is called Cherokee Roses. I brought oh, sorry, out- Lynn, we had, okay. uh, we had another question. The second from the left isn't a deer. The second from the left? For um, the painting on the shield? There is no deer. These are birds. Okay, the hanging Bird. object. Um, they're wondering if that wasn't deer. No, these are all birds. And this is a crescent moon. Um, and then the, has there been any interest in returning the shield to the native peoples? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, I couldn't answer that. But I will say that if you visit our Native American galleries, 
I find it interesting um, that um, the, um, what is the word I'm looking for when um, the Native, Native Americans have pipes and there is an object at the end, but the actual stem of the pipe is um, the most sacred part of the pipe. We do not have any of those stems in the museum because they have all been returned to the Native American people. So we do, I know that the museum does try to respect the cultures, um, but I just, you know, the Michigan connection with this and the fact that, um, that it speaks to Little Rock really, again, speaks to me. Uh, so one person made a comment, it's, uh, and excuse me, I'm probably not going to pronounce this correctly, but rep repatriation or repatriation? Uh-huh. Repatriation, meaning giving yeah. it back to the um, to the Native Americans. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to move on now. And again, um, this is a painting by an American artist. It is called Cherokee Roses. It was made in 1890. It's very small. It's 10 inches by 16 inches. This painting is usually always on view, and I purposely put this one after um, Little Rock's Shield because. The Cherokee Rose is about the Trail of Tears. And um, as you know, the Trail of Tears where the Native Americans were forced to move um, west through the years, it, it encompassed a long period of time. And it was very brutal. Um, many of the, um, the members died and they gave up hope. And this painting was, um, depicts a legend that the Native Americans, the Cherokees, um, developed. As the women and the, uh, were going, um, were walking westward, they were losing hope and they were finding it difficult to, um, to bear children and to keep their children healthy and alive. And the men of the, um, of the nation sought help from the spirit gods to try and solve this because they wanted to reach their destination and they wanted the Cherokee nation to rebuild again. And so they sought guidance from the spirits and the spirits answered them by telling them to speak to their women and to tell the women as they shed their tears along the trail to watch where the tears would fall along the trail and if they look behind them that they would see a flower that would begin to grow and that flower would would be very difficult to kill and the legend says that it then as the women saw these flowers growing it gave them the inspiration to be able to continue moving on and to um, have faith in their future so the cherokee rose um, is symbolic of it has seven leaves which stand for the seven um, nations of the cherokee um, family it has a, five, a rose that grows with five petals, which represent the purity of the women. And inside the rose, you see this clump of gold, which reminds them of the reason that they were being forced to, um, to relocate was because there was gold in their land and the, European, or the, the white people wanted their gold. Um, this is not a, a plant that is uh, native to America. I believe it is native to China, but it is very invasive. It is very strong and sinewy and it's not easy to, easy to kill. So any questions on this one? Yes, actually. Uh, someone is wondering why the frames are not included in the presentation of the painting. Oh, I don't know why they don't give us pictures with the frames. I don't know if it's because um, sometimes, you know, people believe that the frames detract from the painting, but yeah, none of the presentations have the frames included. I will try to mention when we get further along, if there are some that have beautiful frames that you should make it a point to notice in the museum. Martin Johnson Heat, I did forget to mention, um, was an American painter that specialized in florals and hummingbirds. And I have an image later on that um, goes into a little more detail about what, what he did. Anything else, Katie? Uh, not at the moment. Okay, I'm going to move on. All right, so we're back to in the garden. 
Everyone is familiar with Monet, very well-known painter. This was painted in 1876. This image is 23 by 32. It's not in the museum a lot because it travels. So we, we do share our images with other museums. And if any of you came down to our exhibit, I think it was about two years ago, we were very lucky because our curator, Jill Shaw, um, took the painting out of its frame and she displayed it in, a, in, a, in an acrylic case and gave us the ability to walk all the way around the painting. So what you're looking at is the back side of the painting and you see here there's the, the wooden frame of the painting and there's light being transmitted through the painting. Just to show you that even though this is an impressionist painting and when you look at it, you can see that the, the paint is applied in very thick brush strokes, um, very thick application of paint, very quick brush strokes, and a variety of types of brush strokes. But there's also a lot of blank space. Specifically, if you look, you can see that, you know, on the front of the image, you can see that there are butterflies. That's an absence of color as opposed to see something being painted in. So when we look at this image of the garden, a um, couple things I'd like to point out is the fact that this is what the, the brush stroke detail looks like up close. And here is the detail of Camille. Camille is Claude Monet's first wife. Um, she is often depicted with that green parasol and you see her here in her blue walking dress that would have been um, the color of a dress you would use to go out in um, in that time period because it didn't show the dust from the roads and so on um, something that's interesting is that if you look at this painting unlike the mary cassatt painting camille isn't the subject of this painting the subject of this painting is this beautiful garden that Claude Monet actually planted himself. We know of um, 15 different paintings that he um, painted of this garden and he painted it in all seasons. The season that we're in, if you take a look, you see gladiola, again, you see the butterflies, you see um, roses and geraniums, Obviously, this is a summer scene. It's a warm day. And we know that the sun is out because one of the things that I love about this painting is that if you look at it closely, you see down here, that's a shadow. That's a shadow where the sun is um, creating a shadow of Monet's actual home. If you were to go to this house, he lived here, I think, a period of seven years. It was his first home. Um, he and his wife, Camille and their, their son, John, um, lived here in Argentoya, France. And as I said, um, this is a picture of his flower garden. The name of the painting is Corbet de Fleur. I'm sorry, I don't speak French, so don't laugh at me. <laughs> but that means rounded flower bed. And it's so interesting to note that when the curator Jill Shaw took the frame off of this painting and um, this painting was has labels on the back of it uh, that tell where it's been throughout its life. She was able to trace the history of this painting back to when it was first exhibited by Claude Monet. And she realized that that was the actual title of the painting, even though we had known it to be Gladiola for very many years. Some of the things, um, now for those of you who are familiar with Impressionists, um, they don't, especially like Claude Monet, they were in a movement where um, they were interested in painting exactly what they saw. They didn't idealize things. They didn't worry about proportions. The Gladiola are probably too tall compared to Camille. Um, you can't really see Camille's face. It's not photorealistic. But what Claude Monet was doing is he was taking his tubes of paint, 
his portable easel, his pre-stretched canvas, and his pre-made um, brushes, which were all available in this time period due to industrialization. And he was not um, drawing on the canvas and, and taking huge amounts of time to put this, um, this painting together. He was working very quickly outside, directly paint onto canvas. He was working in plain air. And again, this was because of the change in industrial and the fact that he could buy tubes of paint and when he used a little bit of it, he could put the lid on and it would stay fresh until the next time. Um, but they were interested in painting exactly what they saw, not worried about um, what the, um, the, the, uh, the salons described as appropriate painting. Any questions? Uh, yeah, so is the thick, um application of paint intentional or is that just from quickly getting an impression of what what he saw with the paint working quickly? The thick application of paint is intentional. It's intentional because um, the salons did not allow these painters to exhibit these works. They were mortified by this painting style. The salons wanted paintings that were very smooth finished and were, um, were not about ordinary people. Again, historical figures and mythological figures were okay, but your everyday wife walking in the garden was not something that was supposed to be depicted. Um, so the artists who were in this group of impressionists didn't call themselves that. How they they got that name was um, Claude Monet actually painted a, pi a picture by the name of Impression Sunrise. And um, they considered themselves realists because they were painting what they really saw. But um, one of the art critics called them impressionists and it was intended as a der derogatory term, but they adopted it for themselves. Um, as I said, Mary Cassatt um, was with the impressionists, but um, the impressionists were all over the place in terms of their painting styles, but they were really avant-garde and they were bucking the system and they eventually banded together and created their own exhibitions. And um, we all love them now today, but at the time they were not popular. Okay, I'm gonna move on then. All right. We're never gonna get to the number of images that I have, but you know, <laughs> Hopefully, we'll do this another time. Um, I did want to give you, show you this picture of Claude Monet on the left. Some people say that he's got his little COVID beard. Um, and um, on the right is Camille, his wife. That's what she actually worked, she looked like. And unfortunately, Camille died not long after that um, painting was finished. Okay, so here we go to another continent. This is the horse and rider, it's from the African continent, and it is from the kingdom of Benin. Benin. Um, not to be confused with the country of Benin. This is an ancient kingdom. Um, this is called the horse and rider, and it is, um, a, it, it is a statue or a sculpture that is created using a mold. Um, I'm going to try to remember, this is 19 inches tall by seven inches wide. This is made of bronze. And what you're looking at um, is a, this bronze figure is a, a, obviously a man riding a horse. So the horse does apply to nature. But you can also notice that this is done in a very different style. If you look at the proportions, you look at the, um, this, huge, this huge hat and headdress that this man has, and you look at how large the man is in proportion to this horse, which seems quite small, this is very symbolic of the fact that this person, whoever he is, was royalty because in the African culture, the size of the person denotes their importance and he is towering over this horse. The fact that he's actually riding a horse also denotes royalty because in the, in the 17th century, it would not have been common for anyone other than royalty to have a horse because the horses were brought to Africa um, 
through trade routes, through Arab, um, Arabic traders and so on. But the horses did not thrive in Africa. They were very susceptible to disease caused by tsetse flies. So you had to be, it was a luxury item be, to have a horse because the horses would only live six months to one year. Many of the things that you see depicted on this statue denote the fact that this is a ruler. From the hatch marks you see, as well as the fact that he has a shield, you see hatch marks down here on the pedestal. Again, the pedestal denotes royalty because he is elevated above everyone else. Um, and this, while we don't know who actually created this piece, and we don't know who the ruler was that is depicted on it, what we do know is in the, in the, in the uh, Benin culture, this person would have been a deceased um, king. And whoever his predecessor was, was required to construct, um, to place on an altar that person who has been deceased. How this also ties into In the Garden is that this piece was made by um, a method called the Lost Wax Method. So what you see here is a sculpture made of wax, which is, of course, um, a product of the garden and bees. Um, and this is my, not, the, not the sculpture that was used to make this piece, but it's a more recent, oops, sorry, a more recent sculpture. How this piece was made is that the artist would carve the, the statue or the sculpture out of wax. And then they would pack the wax with clay and the clay would be fired and hardened. The clay would cause, it would, would be put so thickly it would become a cube. There would be a hole that would be drilled in the bottom of the clay. And as after the, um, the clay had hardened, the wax would melt on the inside and the wax would flow out of the bottom of the mold. And then the mold would be then filled with bronze or some type of metal, which had been molten, and it would create the statue that you see here. The fact that this is made of um, uh, so indicative of the fact that and a very wealthy person because only wealthy people would have had access to metals and things like this. I understand that um, when it was in its original state, because this piece is quite old, it's from the 17th century. This area here shows you a little bit of the red color, but when you mix um, uh, bronze, um, it, you can, depending on what alloys you mix it with, it can um, retain some of its chemical nature to, um, to have color to it. So any questions on this one? Yeah, um, someone was wondering what the hatch marks mean. It's just, I don't know why hatch marks are a sign of royalty, but if you think about it, and I'm going out, this is my own interpretation, so I'm going out on a little bit of a stretch here, but if you think about it, think about the African culture, and you think about the clothing that they, that they weave, like the kente cloth. When you wear something, it is, um, it's, it's symbolic. It tells, this, is, this was a culture that didn't pass their stories down or their, um, their knowledge down through writing. This was a visual culture that you would see representations of things and you would um, naturally understand what was being portrayed. So that's more what the hatch marks are related to. Anything else? Uh, nope, not at the moment. Okay. This is a painting by a German painter by the name of Paula Moderson Becker. I don't know if any of, for those of you who go to the museum, I was going to say that this one is usually always on display on, in our German Expressionist Gallery, which we have a phenomenal collection. And it is still open and it is on display. I was down there um, last weekend. This was painted by Paula Moderson Becker in about 1905. When you look at this painting, 
you, you know, let's look at it together. You see a woman, she's obviously an older woman. She's got these heavy eyelids. Her features are not stylized or beautified. This is exactly how she looks. She's not dressed in any elegant attire. Um, she's dressed very simply in this blue outfit and she has a gesture where her hands are being um, folded over her chest. That gesture is a symbol of resignation. If you think about some of the Renaissance art where you see the Virgin Mary receiving the news that she is going to be carrying the Christ child, you'll often see her depicted in that same gesture. It's a symbol, it's symbolic of the fact that I understand and I accept. And Paula Moderson Becker um, lived in, um, in Northern Germany and she made a series of paintings where she depicted peasants who lived in, um, in a village um, by the name of Warpswede near her home. And the reason that she depicted the peasants was because she wanted to, she was looking back to nature and she wanted to um, give dignity and grace to the simple people um, and the basic people in the world. And uh, you notice also that um, the way that she treats this very, um, this very plain looking woman is very dignified. If you look at behind the woman around her head, very much like the Mary Cassatt painting that we looked at, there's this sort of a, a glow that comes through. Um, perhaps this woman is sitting next to a window and you see the leaves outside the window, but there's a glow that almost gives her um, a halo around her head. Um, you also notice that she has some flowers that are set aside in her lap. And just like the original painting that we started with by Rachel Royce, those flowers are symbolic of um, the cycle of life. And primrose in particular is a symbol of youth. And by the fact that this sprig of flowers is simply lying in her lap and she's not holding them. And the gesture that this woman is, is giving is, is symbolic of the fact that um, she's no longer young. Um, her life is passing her by. She no longer is of childbearing age, but she understands that the things that are important in life are not things that you can acquire. It's, um, you, need to, you need to be introspective and um, she's resigned to the fact that she has accepted um, her life and she is content with it. Any questions on this one? Uh, just that um, there seems to be like the halo appears in a lot of uh, paintings I don't know if it's around that time or earlier than that, but um, is is there any significance or relation to like paintings painted a uh, hundred years earlier that also use that, or um, is there a difference? Um, there really isn't. I think that Paul Moderson Becker was using that concept of um, the hand gestures and the, the, the glow, the radiance around this, um, this woman's head as a means of elevating her dignity and her importance. Again, the halo, when you see that in older paintings and in um, specifically in Renaissance art, it depicts someone that's holy. And again, she's just drawing off of, of prior artists work. Okay, I'm going to move on. It is 725. Shall we just keep going for a while? Uh, I believe, yeah, let's go for a couple more and then we'll, we'll open it up to um, questions on anything. Okay. 
This is an older painting. Um, it was created in 1475. It is 31 inches by 23 inches. And you see the name of the artist. Is, uh, is, he's known as the master of the St. Lucie legend. That's because we don't really know his name. But we do know that he painted a very famous altarpiece called the St. Lucie altar. altar. Um, and they do know that this is the same artist who painted that. There um, is a lot of symbolism that's going on. On in this painting. This is an oil on oak panel, and that's because canvas obviously wasn't something that artists painted on that long ago. Um, <clears throat> what you see depicted in this painting is um, basically uh, the artist is incorporating three different time elements in this painting. And you'll notice that the, well, let's start of all, first of all, that there is this enclosed garden. The enclosed garden that you see here um, is depicting paradise and Adam and Eve. And we all know who this is, right? This is Mary. Again, it's a visual recognition. When you see a woman and a baby on her lap, and the woman is dressed in red and blue, we automatically recognize that as being Mary. This is a Flemish painting, but again, it's the same thing as with the paint, the horse and the rider. People did not read and write at this time, so the visual recognition was very important. What you see here is Mary depicted um, in her earthly state, but you also see her see the crown above here because as she is not only honored on earth, but as when she ascends to heaven, she becomes the queen of heaven. You see the baby Jesus giving something to a woman. These women are all saints. This happens to be Saint Catherine. This is a, so when I said the artist was depicting th three different things, this is um, the time period from 1100 to 1300 that these women were um, martyred or sainted. And during that time period, Catherine had a dream where she envisioned herself mystically being married to the, 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 um, the Jesus as a baby. And if you look closely at the painting, you'll see what he is handing to Catherine is a ring. So it's symbolic of that dream of marriage. Um, you also see in the background here, some of the detail of the garden. The garden and the roses, because the roses again are a symbol of Mary. Um, a symbol of her purity and her virginity. The third period that you see depicted in this painting is actually Bruges, the city that this artist lived in, in the year of 1475 when this painting was painted. You see the ramparts of the city. You see this tall building here that is the church and this um, other building here that's depicted is the cloth factory. Bruges was a very, very wealthy city that was known for its, um, its creation of tapestries at the time. Um, the thing that I find really interesting about this painting is if you look at it from today's, um, the way we paint today, the perspective is totally off because in 1475 perspective was not something and it's really noticeable right here because you see this this kind of wall that encloses the garden um, the people are just placed in the foreground um, the enclosed garden which would have been a very difficult thing to paint because as i i'm not a painter but i understand using all of these types of green and all of this would have been a very difficult thing to accomplish um, and then you see it's almost like you're looking out onto the city. Uh, are there any questions on this one? Uh, nope, I don't see any. Oh, I'm sorry, there is one. What are the white things in the background? They look like glaciers. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. And that's not the first time that question has been asked. So um, again, you know, we're, we're very lucky 
that we are able to be as docents, that we are able to learn from the curators at the DIA and that they share their knowledge. But we, what we don't do is we don't go out on the internet and just Google things because there are lots of interpretations of things. And I have to admit that there are things in, in like I, I know the names of these saints but I don't personally know the stories of them. So to some extent, you know, we need to rely on what we're told. That has never come up in the conversation. And it's not, like I said, the first time that that question has been asked. So we probably do need to ask that at some point. Thank you. Okay, so this image is, it's, uh, is an image for, of Parvati. Parvati is the consort of Shiva or the wife of Shiva. So in the Hindu community, there are thousands of gods and people can choose who they wish to worship. And um, there are several main deities. There is, um, Shiva is one of them. Shiva is considered the destroyer. Vishnu is considered the protector and Brahma is considered the creator. Usually people will incorporate one of those three main deities in their, um, uh, I'm losing the word I'm looking for, but in their, in their, um, their religious process. Shiva is, as I said, the wife of I'm sorry, Parvati is the wife of Shiva. And Parvati is depicted here in a state that you would not normally see her in. This is a brass um, sculpture. And as you look at the sculpture, you notice that she has a very elaborate um, hairstyle or a headdress. She has earrings, which are pulling down and elongating her ears. She has this, um, this plate around her um, neck or her chest. She has a cord that travels down across her abdomen. She has um, armbands. She has wristbands. She's wearing this um, flimsy sort of material that's covering her lower body. You notice that she's very feminine. Um, as you go down further, you notice that she is standing on bejeweled sandals. And do you see what she's standing on here? Does anyone recognize this? it's a lotus flower. So that's how this piece ties to our In the Garden talk. The lotus flower, as you may know, grows in a very murky body of water. It sets its roots down into the mud way down below and it shoots its stems up. And then this beautiful pink flower emerges from the surface. The lotus flower is a symbol of purity. As I said, even though this is a very feminine sculpture and um, what Parvati denotes is when she is always, um, she is always seen with her husband, but she takes a lesser, so she is secondary to her husband. But when they are seen together, they balance each other. She is a symbol of fertility, of love, of marriage, of harmony. Um, many things that, um, you know, fertility, but fertility of fruits of the earth and so on. If you notice that below the lotus, you'll see that there is a base that has four rings on it. The way that we see Parvati displayed here is not how she would see, be seen either in a shrine or in public. I do want to mention the fact that Hindu people believe that um, the, the God that they are praying to is actually inside of, the, of this sculpture. Whatever they are praying to, the God is present there, the God sees them, they see the God, they're communicating. So a lot of times there will be shrines within people's homes where they will worship. That was the word I was looking for before. <laughs> Um, and what Parvati would look like if she was being carried, this is not our Parvati, but she would be draped in sumptuous fabrics and garlands of flowers. And there would be poles that would be put through those four 
um, four hooks down on the bottom and she would be carried elevated through the streets so that she could be seen by people. Um, this image on the right hand side is actually a shrine that would be more in a person's home. You see that there are five cups that contain um, fresh flowers. And quite often, you know, you go into businesses and you see personal shrines that people have created because not only do they leave flowers um, uh, in respect to for the gods, but they often leave things like fruits and vegetables. Uh, are there any questions on this one? I don't see any. Okay, I'm going to do one more and then we're going to open it up. Okay. All right. This is a photograph and it is quite small. It is 10 by 13. I have never actually seen this photograph in person. Um, and that's because there are a lot of things in the museum that are very fragile and works on paper are very fragile. So they don't spend a whole lot of time on display. They spend most of their time in a temperature and um, light controlled environment. This is a photograph that was taken by a woman by the name of Imogen Cunningham. And what's surprising to me, this is a magnolia blossom, but when you look at this image, doesn't it look contemporary? because it is so close up and to the point. But look at when she made it, 1924. This Imogen Cunningham was a remarkable woman. She started, um, she started with her interest and became an artist um, using photography at a very young age. But then when she went off to college, she realized that her real passion was chemistry. So she got a degree in chemistry specifically because she wanted to be able to use chemicals and do her own developing. One of the quotes that um, Imogen Cunningham uh, is attributed to her is the fact that um, she was a wife and a mother. She had three young children living at home while she was developing her career. And um, she always kidded that she had one hand in the dishpan and the other hand was in the dark room. <laughs> um, this artist is, um, reminds me very much of another very uh, similar artist. Doesn't it look like something that perhaps um, Georgia O'Keeffe would have painted? Yes. Very much so, doesn't it? <laughs> um, and so while I don't know if they ever knew each other, they were certainly working around the same time period and um, they had the same eye. Georgia O'Keeffe was a painter. Imogen Cunningham was a photographer. I do want to show you um, a photograph of on the right, we have a self-portrait of Imogen Cunningham along with her camera. And on the left, we have a portrait of uh, Frida Kahlo, who was Diego Rivera's wife. Um, the, the reason I bring this up is because this image um, of Frida Kahlo was taken when Imogen Cunningham, um, their paths crossed in New York when Diego Rivera was working at the, at the in the, in the, on the mural in New York. And as we all know, we have a fabulous mural at the DIA created by Diego Rivera. Um, but Imogen Cunningham, mostly, she went through different periods. Sometimes she would, um, she started out as a portrait photographer and you can see the skill that she has here. Now granted, uh, Frida Kahlo's, I believe it was her father was also a photographer. So she was very familiar with how she would pose herself and how she wanted to be portrayed in portraiture um, and in pictures, but um, one of the things that Frida Kahlo said is that she has a whole world of sorrow in her eyes. And you can, and Imogen Cunningham has really captured that. Um, as, as we know, Frida Kahlo didn't have an easy life. She had a, uh, she was involved in an accident quite young and it, you know, it debilitated her for most of her life. Um, Imogen Cunningham worked until she died at the age of 93. 
And another quote that I absolutely love from this remarkable woman is one time in an interview, she was asked, what's your favorite photograph? And she said, oh, that's easy. The one I'm going to take tomorrow. So she was constantly looking forward, <laughs> never looking back. <laughs> okay, you guys, I have an awful lot of other images, but you know, it's been, uh, it's 20 minutes to eight now. Do we have any questions? Does anyone want to talk about anything? And I'd certainly welcome you back for a part two for In the Garden, too. We'll just have to take a look at the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because we have a lot of images that I didn't get through. Um, you know, I'm going to just, as we talk, I, you know, as we are wrapping up, I guess, I am going to just show some of these images because, as I said, there. When you're looking at images with a sp specific theme in mind, it's amazing how many different pieces throughout the museum you will notice um, have something to do with that theme. And one of the ones that I didn't get to is this piece here, which most people, if you look at this piece, will say, what is that? And I admit, I would walk past this piece probably hundreds of times through the years. And I never quite got it until I started to learn about it. So this is a piece I'd really like to share with you at a future date because there's a lot to it in it. And it does tie in with our theme. Um, I think a couple other people are super interested in a, a part. <laughs> so we're, we're definitely going to have to set that up. And then somebody has their hand raised. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute them. OK. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. I just wondered, I thought Shiva was a girl, but that statue is a girl. That is Parvati. Yeah, is Shiva, I thought she was a girl because she represents um, CERN, you know, that machine. I mean, they have a big statue of her there and I always thought she was a girl. Is she male, Shiva? Shiva is a man. And you know, there was an image that I didn't oh. include um, that if you look at some illustrations that we have in the museum, you will see that Shiva is a man. He is usually depicted, um, you know, you talk about symbolism and how it crosses cultures that have nothing to do with one another. Shiva is usually depicted much larger than Parvati. And that's because he is the more important God. She is secondary to him. Um, and you, a lot of times you will see him depicted in the color blue. I, I think it has something to do with the fact that blue is related to royalty, but I'm not really sure on that. I'd have to actually go back into my notes and look for that. But if you go to the museum and you see pictures of Shiva and Parvati together, you will see that Shiva is a male. I'm we not sure. Have, oh, I'm sorry. We had a comment um, and this person says uh, Shiva is often depicted as both male and female. Okay. So there goes the answer to that. Thank you very much for explaining that. Any other questions? We'll give them a moment to, to type if there are any questions. If not, I wanna thank Lynn for um, joining us tonight and presenting all that wonderful information about um, the sculptures and the paintings and the, the photographs. I learned a lot and I hope you did too. So um, thank you so much for, for sharing all of that with us, Lynn, and I'll definitely be bringing you back for a part two. And if you're interested, Lynn is going to be presenting on the topic of Vogue in November. Um, and it's going to be on a Wednesday, I believe at 6.30. I will have to look up the date, but uh, you can check it on our event calendar and go ahead and register for that as well. So we hope to see you back uh, in November with Lynn on the topic of Vogue. I wanna thank everyone for joining me tonight. And um, I also want to put in a plug, first of all, for the DIA. And if you haven't been down there, please, 
Um, if you're comfortable with going out, put on your mask, register online, get your ticket. Um, they only allow so many people in the museum and it's really kind of nice to be in the museum when it's not crowded and you can you can see it, take your time and see everything. But they also have an exhibit that is scheduled to open on November 15th. Um, and the exhibit is going to be held in the um, where we would normally have our contemporary gallery. It's called Cars, and it's about the um, the design and the um, it, it encompasses actual cars that have been brought into the museum. So that part of the museum is closed to the public at this point. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that it is more difficult to. Um, to tour electronically. But when we get back to having time in the museum, I really hope all of you will come down and visit us and um, once the museum allows us to tour again. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And if you are a resident of Oakland County, uh, I believe there's either a reduced admittance fee or it's free um, if you show that you, if you have proof that you live in Oakland County. That is true. It is free. Thank you very much to everyone for passing the millage again. So the admission to the museum is free to everyone who lives in Oakland, Macomb, or Wayne County. Okay, I'll see you next month, Katie. Thanks a million. Thank you so much, Lynn. And we'll be sending now, um, you'll probably, hopefully you won't uh, be, um, uh, frustrated by the amount of emails you get from us because you'll also be getting an uh, email with the survey link. But I will get that list of um, images for you from Lynn and I'll send that out to you and that will be coming directly from me. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, hope you enjoyed it and hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Katie. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everyone.